Welcome to our second lecture in this series. I am Dr. Lisa Wisniewski. I am an associate professor of sociology at Goodwin University. Um, I'll be moderating our session today. Um, today, we're gonna focus on a movie review of the film, Mr. Jones. So we did, if you joined us last time, we did give you a bit of homework um, to watch the film, but in case you did not have that opportunity, um, what I will do is uh, read a description of the film and of the, of the circumstances that we're going to be talking about today. I will then talk, uh, introduce my uh, panelists and then we're gonna go into a panel discussion about it, okay? So the film, Mr. Jones is circled around the Holodomor, which was a man-made man -made famine in grain growing regions of Soviet Russia, Kazakhstan and Ukraine that spanned from 1932 to 1933. The famine was caused by a movement to collectivize agriculture starting in 1929. Farmers were forced to give up their land, personal property, and homes to collect to collective farms. This led to drops in production and food. During this time, specific policies focused on Ukraine led to the deaths of 4 million individuals in Ukraine alone. About 5 million in total passed during this time. In addition to the famine, there was a focus on repression of Ukrainian culture, government, and language. The West was not aware of what was happening due to restrictions placed on journalists to report their findings. This brings us to the film, Mr. Jones. The film follows two journalists from the West, Walter Durante of the New York Times and Gareth Jones, a freelancer from Wales. Jones was the first to report the Holodomor outside of the Soviet Union. Durante was tasked with dismissing reports of the famine and the reportings of Jones. The headline, Russians Hungry But Not Starving, written by Durante, became widely accepted in the West and discussions of the famine ceased. It is believed that Durante's writings had significant influence on the new Roosevelt administration to open full diplomatic relations with Moscow. Jones died of mysterious circumstances in Mongolia in 1935. In the time since, there's been little discussion of the Holodomor. As of 2019, only 16 countries in the Vatican have recognized the Holodomor as a genocide. The film chronicles Jones's entrance into Ukraine where he witnessed the effects of the famine on the people. Our discussion today will focus on the areas of communication, how films influence how we understand history and ethical concerns within professions, specifically focusing on how to use the written word in a responsible way. So now I would like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, we have Dr. Brian Dixon joining us. He is an associate professor of English here at Goodwin University. He received his PhD from the University of Rhode Island where he specialized in cultural studies. And his academic writings include studies concerning 19th century American literature, detectives, detectives in film and fiction, ethnic humor in British sitcoms, and the James Bond films. Among the classes that he teaches at Goodwin is English 303, Film and liter Literary Adaptation, a course that provides students with an introduction to film studies and invites them to think critically about what they see on screen. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Anytime. And we have Dr. Randy Lace is a professor of English at Goodwin University in the University of Bridgeport. He is the author of several books, including Cin Cinema of Simulation, Hyperreal Hollywood in the Long 1990s and the Twin Towers in Film, a cin Cinematic History of the World Trade Center. He has edited collections of essays in the fields of popular culture, literary criticism and pedagogy. He lives in New Haven with his lovely wife, Anne, assorted children and Sigmund the cat. Randy, thank you so much for joining us here today as well. Thank you, Lisa and Brian, and to all our lovely guests joining us for this wonderful conversation. So, so now let's get started with our conversation. So I gave you some background. Um, I, I couldn't ask to, to the panel and feel free to let us know in the comments. Do you all get a chance to watch the film um, you know, before? Um, let us know in the comments while we start our panel discussion. Our, we'll have three main questions. I'm gonna actually set, uh, let you know what the questions are um, and then we're gonna get started. We do have some film clips that we'll show you as well. So at first we're gonna talk about how is communication influencing how we understand our world. Next, we'll go into a conversation about how we understand history based on who is telling history and a discussion on ethical concerns within professions with a specific focus on writing. All right, so my first question to the panel, how is communication influencing how we understand our world? 
right? So early on in the scene, we see there's some communication happening. We don't have the full story, but uh, Jones loses one of his uh, main contacts, right? So how is this communication influencing how we understand our world? Brian, would you like to, I don't even want to, um... Yeah, sure. I'd like to. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll launch into it because communication is is one of the dominant themes of the film, and and this is established very very well in the opening uh, scenes of the film. Uh, in my English three hundred three class, which you alluded to in the introduction, in my film classes, we talk an awful lot about thematic unity. Um, how how is it a film finds a way to establish its themes and reassert them uh, scene by scene in each character relationship and each thing that we see on screen. Uh, and uh, Mr. Jones does this really, really well in, in the first three or four scenes that we have. It repeatedly hammers home this idea of communication and how difficult it can be to be taken seriously or to get across news that might be difficult to receive. Um, the, the first scene in the film is uh, Gareth Jones talking with some British politicians, trying to tell them about what's happening in Germany at the time, which is sort of running parallel to all the horrors that we see in the Soviet Union. We know as students of history very well, uh, we're more familiar perhaps with what is happening in Germany at the time. Uh, and, and the very first scene, uh, Jones is talking with these British politicians and trying to assert uh, it's, the threat of Germany needs to be taken seriously and the politicians are openly laughing at him. Uh, they can't take seriously what, we, what he has to say. And if, if this point is lost on you that it's difficult to get through to people, the very next thing that happens, I have it in my notes, just how hammered home this is. Uh, the very next thing that happens is uh, uh, Jones receives a telephone call. Um, uh, he goes out to answer the phone and there's nobody on the other line. He says, hello, two or three times. There's nothing but muffled noises, silence, and then a disconnect. Um, I think after see seeing the film a few times, uh, we might fill in, maybe this is Paul Klebb trying to reach him a bit earlier than when he gets through uh, later on. But uh, whatever, whatever, whoever was on the other end of that telephone call, it serves to sort of hammer home this idea that getting through to someone, making a connection so with someone can be difficult. And this is going to pay off in major ways uh, later in the film when the message that Jones has to convey is very, very serious. You know, um, if I, you don't mind, I just uh, jump off, jumping off on that point. Uh, interestingly, you know, even before we see the scene where Jones is trying to convince all these British politicians about the threat that Hitler poses, saying something that we hear a lot these days, saying, he says, the next great war has already begun. And this kind of like gave me chills when I heard it because I was like, oh, well, that's kind of what they're saying right now about the current crisis. But anyway, but even before that, there is a kind of a, a setup scene or the frame story that we, you know, we talked about last time we talked about, about George Orwell writing Animal Farm. And in that kind of opening set, setting up a scene that kind of introduces Orwell and a bunch of animals and, you know, uh, starts us off by kind of acknowledging sort of the, the, the relationship between uh, not only the Mr. Jones, who is the farmer in Animal Farm, and Gareth Jones, who is obviously the Mr. Jones of this movie, but also, like, more broadly, the, rela the, the relevance of the artist to telling stories like this. And in the voiceover, Orwell is saying to himself something like, um, you know, the future is at stake, and it's really important that people listen to the story that I have to tell. He's not telling the story uh, of Mr. Jones, he's telling the story of Animal Farm, but it is the story of Stalinist totalitarianism and what a threat it represents to mankind and to like, you know, the global order and stuff like that. And he's thinking like, well, how am I going to tell a story like this that will get people to listen to it? Um, maybe I need to tell an allegory. And so that's the idea about Animal Farm, that he's going to like turn all the characters, all these historical figures into animals and then tell like a, a, a nursery rhyme kind of fable about it. But then it also suggests that us watching this movie is kind of like an allegorical thing. So we're seeing the movie about Mr. Jones, this historical, you know, fictional document or you know, documentary style uh, story of true events. But at the same time, we also kind of read it on an allegorical level as a story about, uh, about control of information, about journalistic ethics, like, uh, you know, we're gonna talk about later and all these other uh, issues that come up over the course of the story that are all introduced uh, again, like just right from the beginning, like Brian said, but even like before the beginning with the Orwell frame narrative, it seems like 
Orwell's role in the movie is to kind of like be, to remind us that telling the story is the most, in a way, like the most important part of like history, like just getting like facts out there and getting people to listen. Because as Brian says, there is a lot of like, you know, ways that information is deliberately controlled by totalitarian authorities in the film, you know, like by pulling the plug on the person in the talking on the phone or by following people around on the street or by killing people or, you know, all the different kinds of ways that they pull the plug on, you know, information. But really, ultimately, uh, I think the most damning thing that this movie suggests is that the problem about the truth getting out is that people don't want to hear it. You know, that people have like their own internal sensors and their own internal agenda that keeps them from being able to uh, acknowledge the, you know, the reality of uh, of the information that they're presented with. And so, I mean, that first thing about, um, you know, obviously we'll talk about that later in the various uh, incentives that keep people like Durante and maybe even Roosevelt and maybe even like the American public at large from like, you know, wanting to acknowledge the truth about what's going on, you know, in Ukraine. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, there's like uh, the sense that, you know, the, the storytellers have to be able to get the word out using whatever narrative strategies are available to them. So in this movie, I feel like, you know, there's political thriller, there's suspense and intrigue, there's all these kind of like filmic things that I feel like kind of play their same role for the filmmakers of Mr. Jones, that the, uh, the, the allegorical approach that Orwell used in Animal Farm worked for, did for him, like just gave a, let him use like whatever the the generic uh, tools were of a certain like style of communication to, in order to, you know, in the service of this higher, you know, like calling to tell the truth about, in this case, totalitarianism and its hor horrific consequences. Yeah, and Lisa, I think this would be a great chance, a uh, great moment to uh, share the first clip if we could. And while you queue that up, I'll maybe set it up a little, which is, uh, Randy, I think that's an excellent point about, uh, you know, uh, ways in which the allegory can be established or made more palatable for the audience or to prep the audience for the story that they need to hear. Um, I might refer to our remark, remarks to sort of the act structure of this particular film because it feels to me very much like three distinct acts. Uh, it, those who have seen the film may know what I'm referring to, which is the, the first act, which is Jones traveling to Russia in pursuance of the story. Um, has a very particular feel to it. The second act, when he enters Ukraine to see the Holodomor uh, firsthand, uh, has a, its own very distinct feel. And then the third act, when he must return to England and tell his story. Um, and Lisa, we've got your your desktop, but not your uh, not your window. Um, Let me stop. Thank you for letting stop me stop. And, and yeah. <laughs> And uh, these each have a particular feel. And, and uh, the first clip that we're going to set up here is very sort of uh, uh, representative of the feel or style of the first act of the film, which is perhaps the most engaging. Um, and Randy's likened it to a spy thriller. And um, that's exactly what it feels like. Uh, you, you learned from the introduction that I'm a great fan of the James Bond film. So spy cinema is something I, I'm quite an aficionado of. And that's one of the ways this film hooked me right away is with the sort of feeling of a Cold War spy thriller. And there's the same momentum and intrigue and elements like that. Uh, Lisa, I think the clip starts a little earlier uh, than this. Yep. And so the clip here uh, is um, Mr. Jones making a telephone call to his friend and fellow journalist, Paul Klebb. Uh, in Moscow, uh, and we, we see what's uh, involved in making that connection. But how are you getting on, Dean? Центральная телефонная станция Москвы. Слушаю вас. Алло, 
гостиница Метрополь. Мистер Клэп. Я телефон, пожалуйста. Окей, извини. Спасибо. Алло. Гаррет, я пытаюсь добраться до Москвы. Гаррет, Paul? Paul? Hello? Uh, I'm not yet. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, and this was, uh, we had an initial conversation about this a week ago, and I said this was one of the most memorable images from the film to me, was uh, this series of shots in which uh, we witnessed what's involved in making a telephone connection of this kind and uh, what it speaks to, to me, what it brought to my mind immediately. And I think that uh, like many of the messages in the film, highly, highly resonant today um, as well as indicative of the time at which the film was made is we have a tendency to think to ourselves that communication is a one-to-one -one connection. I'm saying something and you're listening to me. And even when this extends to a telephone conversation, or a Twitter conversation or a Facebook conversation, we still have that tendency to reduce it in our minds to somebody said something and I heard it, there were two people involved in this. And whether it's an act of storytelling uh, from person to person or making a telephone connection or sharing information online, the truth of the matter is communication is far, far more complex than that, far dirtier and more uh, nuanced than that. Um, and this moment in the film I think is important because it shows how many people are involved in that chain? Um, you know, we're not just talking about telephone operators, we're talking about uh, the um, engineers responsible for laying the cable and make the companies who make sure that that connection is an option. And so when we start to get a sense later in the film of these large apparatuses that keep the truth from getting out of Russia, um, this image resonates with us because it's not that one-to-one -one connection. It's not just that Paul Kleb can tell the truth to Gareth Jones and the truth is out. Kleb, the second he even mentions it, the apparatus kicks in and he's disconnected from it. And certainly this is something that resonates with us watching the film today, uh, where in the early days of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, you know, the, the, uh, the social media services in Russia went down one by one. Uh, Twitter's plug was pulled one day and uh, Instagram's plug is pulled the next day. Um, and uh, there, are, there are many people involved in making sure that you're able to make that connection to communicate with someone, share ideas with someone. So it really also brings in a conversation about power, right? And power, who holds the power in order to get the conversation, the message out, right? Whether previously we needed this network of phone wires, right? And literally it was just pulling a plug and sorry, no more information. We do find out, um, I want to also just add to the to the point about the clip what we find here Jones is under the impression he had just entered as the movie begins he had just interviewed Hitler on a private plane he now wants to travel to Moscow to interview Stalin his goal is to interview Stalin and get him on the British side in order to stop the progression of Hitler into Europe so he's going there with um intentions of potentially preventing a world war two, uh, two right um however paul is about to tell him i found something big but we find out when jones arrives in moscow paul was killed in a robbery the night before so he never gets the message from paul about what that information is so i think also a lot of this has to go to power who has the power to hold information or to release information well, Lisa, I think that's a great point and like obviously so important in the movie. And I think what's interesting about, you know, something something that I thought about when Brian was just talking is that his use of the word apparatus to describe uh, all these wires and cables and stuff that, uh, that you know, that make old timey phones work. Um, the, uh, you know, obviously in that image that we saw, we see like, as Brian explained, like all the, the, the infrastructure of communication. 
And that, you know, as you said, like, you know, obviously there's the same thing exists in the digital world as well. And you can kind of pull the plug on like Facebook or, and, and, you know, and, and Twitter and uh, Instagram and, uh, you know, Putin has done all those things. But then it also made me think the word apparatus also made me think about larger, like non-physical systems of control that are, you know, in a way the the physical infrastructure is just like a metaphor for like the much more impactful, you know, and invisible ways that, uh, that uh, the invisible infrastructure of like the party apparatus, of course, in totalitarian uh, USSR, but also like, you know, the apparatus of culture, the apparatus of like, you know, of geopolitics, the apparatus of, of you know, of global civilization, the apparatus of like, you know, the New York Times and the apparatus of uh, the, the Hearst papers and all of this like global info system or ecosystem of information that uh, that is, that it seems, as Brian said, like this kind of like, you know, sort of very invisible, you know, kind of spontaneous thing that allows for communication. But in fact, you know, looking behind the wall, like the wires that are running invisibly beneath the surface, these wires and these cables that are manipulated and, and, uh, and controlled by, you know, whoever, uh, you know, they don't just exist in the wall. They also exist in our minds, you know, and in the way we talk to each other and in the attitudes and uh, and uh, and things that we think about and that we don't think about. I don't know. So that's why I mean, that's kind of what made me think about that. The apparatus is not just like the physical thing, but it's like, you know, as we see throughout the movie, it's like people's minds and ideas and expectations and assumptions uh, wind up controlling what they're willing to listen to and what kind of truths they're willing to believe in. It's a, a great point, Randy. And uh, there is a character in this film who seems her primary role in the film seems to be to demonstrate this for us. And that's Ada Brooks, played by Vanessa Kirby. Uh, and I'll just mention right here that the cast in this film is, is excellent. I think uh, uh, each of the main performances is very, very powerful. One of the strengths of the film. Uh, but Ada Brooks is exactly this sort of character where you can see the, the plugs being pulled in her own mind when uh, uh, she, she presented with ideas that challenge her hopes and dreams for the future because she's presented very much as a true believer in the communist experiment, in, in the ideals uh, that uh, were promoted by the Soviet Union. And when Gareth Jones presents her with the truth, uh, referring to Paul Kleb, who we just saw of the truth of Kleb's murder and said, are you saying that Kleb is a necessary sacrifice? You know, we almost see, there's a scene where they have this confrontation over tea and you can just about see, she just shuts down. She just stops talking to him. She puts up the wall in her mind. Um, and it's because that apparatus, uh, political apparatus, social apparatus that gets into each of us, primes us in some ways for a moment of shutdown, for a moment where there is a line for each of us at which we're going to pull the plug and stop listening. Um, and, and I just want to clarify something earlier. Uh, Lisa, you were commenting on uh, Gareth Jones's motivations, and I think this is actually quite key in the film. Um, there, there is some sort of tangential idea that, yes, uh, his cover story he presents when he goes to Russia is, I want to know if the Soviets are prepared to stop the Germans. But uh, we're, it's repeatedly demonstrated in the first half of the film that this is not really his agenda. In fact, his agenda is not more than getting an answer to a question. And his question is, how is the Soviet Union paying for all of the great accomplishments that they're promoting worldwide? And uh, he, he's, uh, he, he says this to Lloyd George, former prime minister of Britain at the very beginning of the film, says this is why I want to go to the Soviet Union. When he's first introduced to Durante, Durante says, why do you want to talk to Stalin? You want to just el rub elbows with the rich and famous? And he says, no, I have a question. And I am always troubled when I have more questions than answers. And this is sort of, from the very start, the, the depiction of uh, the epitome of journalism with Ge which Gareth Jones represents in opposition to Durante. Durante very clearly has political motivations and these pay off by the end of the film. Um, uh, he, he's there for a purpose and he has a political purpose and it relates to communism and the Soviet Union. Uh, Jones, on the other hand, is presented as just a man with questions and wants answers. Yeah, he's very like, you know, it's, he's very like, you know, to almost, you know, to a cartoonish extent when he's talking to Ada and he and he says something like, you know, journalism is like the most noble profession. It's it's the search for the truth, you know, in its purest form or something like that. Uh, you know, obviously the movie wants to like, you know, invest Gareth with that, you know, that kind of Superman like quality where he all he cares about is truth. And it's so neat about Gareth's character that um, in the movie that, you know, when he has a question, he just 
he's going to talk to Hitler. He's going to talk to Stalin. He's going to talk to William Randolph Hearst. It's like he doesn't, you know, he does, it doesn't like, it's like, well, I'll, you know, I'll do some research on the internet. Like he's just going right to like the source, you know, it's just like, uh, he just has this audacity and this sense of like mission that is, uh, that it, even though the performance is so understated, uh, you know, the actor who plays the character is like, you know, just very like low key about the whole thing. But that, you know, that that sense of unstoppable mission, that sense of purpose, I think, uh, comes across, you know, so clearly and uh, really sort of represents, as Brian was saying, you know, all the all the positive values that we associate with, you know, journalism in the abstract sense as this noble calling. Yeah, and there's in pursuit of a, you know. There's a sorry. Value. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's a there, there's a real powerful sense of Jones's character, and and the film is is remarkable in this regard for holding up for a hero for what he was, this sort of daring journalist, and that he had some, as you alluded to, Randy, this sort of innate drive to sort of get to the seat of power and ask the difficult questions. Uh, you know, a couple of things I want to tie into this, and this really starts to go to our next question, right? Which is about how do we understand history based on who's telling. The story right who's sharing the story but I think you also said a couple things in here about you know Jones really was almost naive like I'm gonna go talk to Hitler I'm gonna go talk to Stalin and I'm just going to make it happen right but early on we started talking about you know power and messaging Durante's message he had very minimal obstacles in getting his message out versus Jones encountered obstacle after obstacle and you know there's a couple things I thought to that you know Jones in the movie it was 27 years old Durante was in his 50s, right? So my thoughts were, well, did age have something to do with it? Do we believe Durante more because he was the seasoned, experienced, you know, journalist, right? He had the publications behind him. He had the New York Times behind him, right? You know, there. Um, did his the Pulitzer age, Prize, he had which a, was never revoked. It was never revoked. Did he, did his, being in his 20s, you know, I, I remember, I'm, we all thought we were invincible, right? And did his thirst for just knowledge and truth. And really you see a very humanitarian side of him of wanting to save people as much as he could. Even at the end when he's debating about reporting what he found in Ukraine, he had this threat of the six British engineers who were imprisoned. So he said, yeah, do I good. report this or do I make sure the engineers are okay? And he had a real struggle there, you know? Yeah, no, that's I, that kind of like nuances the picture of him as being like he's not just you know a soldier for truth by any means. He like is concerned about these six engineers and their and what his you know whether he tells his story if it's going to like you know damn them to a lifetime in the gulag or whatever. Right. Um, that and that's like and and I think for the other characters too, you know, to put like a more kind of charitable spin on you know the way Ada and even Durante, uh, you know, behave. They you know. Um, not only are they, you know, like have high hopes for, you know, the communist project and maybe, you know, especially in the 1930s, it seems like kind of the best thing going, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, at least in theory, you know, the idea that they could create this new kind of society and it'll change mankind. And, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, a lot of you know possibilities for people to get so worked up about the, the promise of that, you know, sort of new political idea that it winds up like making other ethical concerns sort of like, you know, less, you know, pressing. Um, but then there's also, you know, in the context of the 1930s, there's this thing about like, well, Hitler, you know, Stalin is bad, but Hitler is even worse. You know, we got to, you know, if Stalin, you got to kind of like uh, backpedal or, or soft pedal uh, the how awful Stalin is or else he might not be a good, uh, you know, he might not help us defeat Hitler. And in the long run, you know, I mean, in a way, like, you know, that was like, you know, a, you know, I don't know if it was like a successful strategy or whatever, obviously. Um, you know, not really, you know, in a sense, um, based on like the, you know, the relationship between Nazi Germany and Stalin's Russia and the way it evolved and devolved throughout the 1930s. But I mean, it just means that like, whenever someone's like thinking about the truth, in a way, I feel like sympathetic to what Ada Brooks says when she says, you know, well, there are many different truths, you know, there are like, you know, different truths for different contexts, and they mean different things to different people. And, you know, the movie kind of like poo poos that idea. But even the movie itself, uh, you know, has this like, um, you know, the movie, to watch the movie, if you were to learn everything you were to know about Holodom the Holodomor from watching this movie, uh, it would be very clear that it's a simple, like, theft operation on the part of, like, the Soviets to steal all of this abundance of grain from the Ukrainian people to intentionally starve them. 
And there's like, you know, there's some like people who think that that's true, but then like, you know, the, the history of the thing is also like, well, they were going through this huge, you know, they're uprooting their entire agricultural system through this process of collectivization. Uh, you know, it's a, such a terrible idea, you know, on this, in so many ways, naturally it resulted in like a sharp decline in production and not to mention all of like the horrible ideas that the Soviets had in general about agriculture and about science and about, you know, like how to organize uh, logistical chains and things like that. You know, there's just so many different things that are going on uh, in the movie. And of course, to tell the movie, though, you know, it's a movie, you know, it's not, uh, you know, a, a 500 page scholarly work, they have to like, tell a story, they have to like, focus in on a narrative and then tell that narrative. And that kind of brings me back to what I was thinking about what Orwell says about allegory in the opening scenes of the movie that that a movie has its own way of telling the truth which is a little bit different than a historian's way. You know, the movie relies on like, you know, these emotional images and there's like kind of a simpl simplified narrative and, uh, you know, character arcs that are like, you know, easy to fit into a two hour time span. Uh, and, you know, I think the movie acknowledges that. It acknowledges its own like, you know, perspective. And I think that's important to keep in mind, especially when we think about how important movies are to the way we remember history in general in our society. And as Brian and I were talking about last week, you know, we never even heard about the Holodomor before we saw this movie. So in a way, like the movie does this more enormously important public service by in by informing us about the deaths of these millions of people and its, you know, historical significance then and now. Uh, but it also it does it in a very specific way that's like, you know, maybe like a starting point for further research or something like that, rather than like, you know, this is what happened and this is the final word. Um, and to, to kind of just quickly go into our comments, right, um, you know, as some of our comments of our audience has been, you know, the film has was really hard for me to watch, too. You know, it was very difficult in many parts, right, um, to, to visualize what had happened, right? Um, and, and I think Brian mentioned, I feel like while well, he said there were three subparts, I feel like there were stories within stories here, right? Especially about history. Um, and Ken actually uh, also responded and asked the question of the age link starts at the opening, right? Would these politicians have last, laughed at an age peer? Was the fact that Jones so much younger, significantly younger, and he was among peers that were much elder, was that the beginning of his downfall, that he wasn't listened to, that he didn't have that protection, right? Because even if you look at how he got his visa, he lied. <laughs> Let's be honest, he lied the whole time. He said he was still employed by the prime minister, even though he had just gotten fired. He, had, he, he went in there with very little protection. He had nothing backing him up. It got him into Ukraine, he, where he was really savvy there. But then who was going to help him in telling the story? Well, you know, I mean, I think that that's an interesting point about his youth. And in a distant way, like, you know, it really is highlighted in that opening scene where you see him, like, you know, in his late 20s or whatever, and all these, like, ancient, old, like, British people, like, all sitting around the table drinking whiskey or whatever. Uh, but also it makes me think, like, well, you know, that's why he was able to see the truth. That's why he could, you know, understand, like, the gravity of, you know, Hitler's rise and of, like, what's going on in the Soviet Union. He wasn't blinded by experience or by all of this, like, you know, all the stories that people tell themselves as they get older about, like, it helps them fossilize their attitudes and, you know, accept, like, easy narratives. Uh, you know, his youth is, like, you know, part of his superpower is his ability to like resist the conventional wisdom and come up with like a new way of thinking. I think R Randy's point about uh, the film's need to boil down or, or crystallize the Holodomor into an uh, e easy to convey and very visually powerful way um, is a great setup for the second clip Lisa, which we might watch, which is this is uh, uh, Gareth Jones boarding a train to head into deeper into Ukraine. Uh, and he has just uh, in a great spy like scene, just uh, evaded his Soviet handler, who's been tasked with officially escorting him on, on a tour of some factories in Ukraine. He's jumped from one train to the next train and he finds himself among Ukrainian peasants. And this is the, the first moment in which he starts to realize what is happening in Ukraine and the severity of it, in the film anyways. In, in real life, Jones had a pretty good idea what was going on in Ukraine before he even got there. But this is one of the ways in which the film dramatizes things. Um, Are we good here, Brian, or do you want me to move it before? I, I, I think we're good. 
I'm not sure. <laughs> I just yeah, have the time in here. It well, looks well, like George well, Orwell's ear, so I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> try it. No audio, it's muted. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Lisa, there's a mute on your video. Sorry. Hunger. Thank you. Work is abolished forever. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, Mark's sort of the beginning of, of what I referred to earlier as Act Two, which is the, the section in the Ukraine where Jones witnesses the Holodomor um, firsthand. And the film is directed by Agnieszka Holland. And uh, this is, uh, she's very artistic in places with how she approaches the subject matter. And, and certainly uh, the Holodomor sequence is one, uh, the film shifts into near black and white desaturation for a number of scenes. And the other thing which you'll see referenced in almost every review I've seen of the film is that the soundtrack stops. There's no musical accompaniment during these scenes. Usually it's some sort of choral accompaniment based on the songs of the children that we hear in Ukraine. And uh, I have a question for you two based on this sequence that we just watched, which is when we had our initial conversation about this film, I started to make a reference to Schindler's List. And before I even finished the sentence, Randy said, the orange. And I said, yes, so Randy and I both immediately, you know, through, through the lens of film, we see this scene where it's desaturated color and this bright orange comes out of his pocket. Boom, immediately we're brought back to that very memorable sequence in Schindler's List in which uh, the Jewish girl's red coat is the only color in, in the entire film. So my question for you guys is, what is the effect or purpose? And I, I think many a film goer, maybe many an audience might have this same reflection since the Schindler's List moment is such a memorable moment in film. Anyone who's seen that movie is never never going to forget it. What do you, what do you think the effect of a scene like this that deliberately or very overtly echoes Schindler's List is? Uh, what's the effect of that in terms of this being a film about the Holodomor and Schindler's List being a film about the Holocaust. I feel like watching as a viewer for this for this film, right? I feel like this is the this was the hardest transition for me, right? This is when it got really real, really, really real. It got real, right? As much as we can talk about what a famine is, to see it depicted on screen was really difficult. And let me uh, even explain. Um, my parents are from Poland, immigrated here. My, all four of my grandparents went through World War II. So I grew up hearing these stories from my grandmother. And I'll, I'll share a, a silly thing. When I was like in my early 20s, I, you know, those pieces of cheese that you have, um, you know, like a pepper jack cheese. I ate a piece of cheese and I realized on the other end it was moldy, right? And I, and 
in my 20 year old exaggerated fashion, went to my grandmother and I'm like, I just ate moldy cheese. And she looked at me as ridiculous as I was. And she just said to me, if you only saw what people ate during the war, go back to your cheese and walked away. And I couldn't help but remember this interaction with my grandmother when I saw this. It was, to me, it was a visualization of what people had lived through, especially um, in my own immediate family, right? And watching, if I'm going to look at it as a film, you know, we had just gone from the scene where he was with his Soviet bodyguard, so to speak, in a beautiful renovated car with a feast. The bodyguard is I don't know, he took like three shots of vodka or something like within a minute, you know, and he, the, the bodyguard is talking about how his daughters are going to the movie and they're dreaming of marrying movie stars. And you go from jumping literally a car to extreme, the this extreme opposite, right? So I think for me, that film had many emotional reactions, having relatives who lived through World War II, right? Um, but also actually seeing what this famine looked like. We're right, a glimpse of what it looked like. And John adds, you know, Ukrainians and cattle cars are reminiscent of the Holocaust. It was this leading up to the historical event, right? Um, I'll, I'll let Randy go and then uh, Brittany Yancey actually has a great point. I also want to bring up in our discussion. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Lucy, you make a great point about the, uh, about the contrast between like the, 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 the Russian car and the Ukrainian car, you know, in the terms of the, 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 the abundance that, uh, that is represented in the scenes in Moscow on the train and in the hotel and, you know, the parties and all the, you know, you know, beautiful, uh, you know, land cityscapes of Moscow. And then of course uh, you jump over to the Ukrainian side and you see that, you know, again, this is the movie's like thesis that all of the wealth and, and, you know, food and everything basically was like sucked out, like the Grinch stole Christmas and he brought it all from, uh, from the Ukrainian countryside to, to Moscow, leaving the Ukrainians completely, you know, destitute as you see them in the clip. And, you know, I feel like, um, you know, obviously that, you know, that contrast is one imp very effective filmic technique that the, you know, filmmakers use to make that, uh, point. And then I feel like, you know, to go back to Brian's question about the orange, uh, you know, I, I, I would, you know, I'm pretty, you know, I would feel pretty confident that uh, Agnieszka Holland uh, did probably have like a, make a specific allusion to uh, Schindler's List. Uh, and, you know, you know, recognizing that Schindler's List was, you know, such a, you know, hugely successful box office smash that at the same time uh, brought a lot of awareness to what happened in the in the Holocaust, you can't help but think that the filmmakers of Mr. Jones kind of want to like, you know, sort of reference that and, you know, kind of like make everybody think, oh, you remember how everybody cares about the Holocaust? And, you know, well, there's this thing too that also killed millions of people but that people don't talk about. But then I also think about what I was saying before about like filmic language and the way this movie like uses specific like filmic techniques to try to make its kind of political or sociological points. And in this case, you know, throughout the uh, the sequence in Ukraine, uh, you know, as Brian says, like, you know, not only on the, in the car, in the, in the scene in the train where it's all like, you know, sort of uh, washed out, the color is all washed out. Uh, then the case, same is the case for all the scenes, like, you know, when Mr. Jones is wandering around and seeing these kids and uh, everything like that. Uh, it's almost as if the filmmaker is specifically alluding to black and white photography as a certain form of communication that has specific like emotional connotations, you know, that like, you know, oh, well now the movie is in black and white. Now we know that it's like pretty creepy. And then even when it, um, you know, it kind of like almost uh, bends into the horror genre or the, you know, shock, you know, kind of like zombie movie genre uh, in the cannibal scene, cannibalism scene, which seems like, you know, in a way, like the first time I watched it, I was like, oh, well, that's a little sensationalistic and exploitative. But then on multi on repeat viewings, I was thinking, well, you know, well, this is like, you know, they need to use zombie horror tropes to express the horror, the real horror of this historical situation. And of course, you know, as you say, you know, it's not really that far in the distant past. And the she scenes of dead bodies on Ukrainian roadsides mm -hmm. certainly is something that, you know, connects mm -hmm. 1933 to 2022 in a very disturbing and visceral way. Yeah, and it's worth noting, um, Randy, that you referred to the, the cannibalism scene. Um, 
And it's one way of us processing, you know, it's one way of the film suggesting to us how far the horror goes of, of this sort of crime against humanity. Um, and it is notably the, the reason that the estate of Gareth Jones objected to this film um, after they had seen it. And uh, the sole reason they objected to the film, I mean, it's a film that holds him up as a great hero. Um, so one might ask, why would they possibly object to, to this particular film? They objected to that specific scene, to the suggestion that even accidentally Gareth Jones might have become a cannibal. Uh, it just goes to say, um, or to demonstrate how, how, you know, how far the horror of that moment goes. Um, and it's, it's something that Holland does in the film to try and say, I cannot adequately show you in 20 minutes the horror of this level of, of crime, but uh, maybe in one scene, we can push it to that absolute limit so that you get a taste of it, no pun intended. Yeah, I think that, yeah, definitely. I mean, if you, to defend that scene, uh, you know, like if you had to like, you know, explain to the, the Jones family, like, you know, why it was necessary to include it. I think that's a wonderful description. And it's like, you know, this is this level of horror. If we're going to describe it in a movie, uh, we have to like do like a night of the living dead thing. Cause that's really the, like the closest we can come in a movie to showing like, you know, the sheer like dehumanization and brutality and, and insanity of, of this situation. And in terms of, uh, I know we're, we're going to want to transition into talking about uh, journalistic ethics and the ethics of write, writing and the written word. Um, and I think there's actually a way to do that. This idea of the allegory, the film being presented as allegory. One of the things I found most fascinating about film, the more I watched it, the more I reflected on it, is the structure of the story, the way the story is set up. And, and uh, Randy will, will know recently, I worked with Randy on a book and, and I wrote a uh, article about... Um, the Indiana Jones franchise in which I started looking at it in mythological terms, you know, how, how is this laid out in the, in the form of a mythological arc for a character. And I see um, be, maybe because I have that sort of thinking on my mind all the time, uh, being a young Ian and all um, that started to come through in my viewing of this film where, you know, we need a hero, we need a villain and the hero has to have a particular journey. And for us, the hero is, Gareth Jones, a journalist of great virtue, as we've we've seen or discussed. Um, and the villain is Walter Durante, a journalist who has gone bad. Um, so the battle between good and evil here is very much a battle of journalism, of the written word and one man's word against another man's word. But there's also, I think, moments in the terms of the allegory of the film uh, where the arc follows this sort of hero's journey. There's a there's a very strange sequence um, earlier in the film at one of Durante's parties where we see drunkenness and debauchery and nakedness and sex and drugs. Um, and it very much feels to me like something like uh, the Lotus Eaters out of Greek mythology where Jones has just come to Russia and if he is gonna be swayed by these temptations at the party, he'll never get at the truth. You know, uh, uh, Like Odysseus and, and his men, he has to resist the Lotus Eaters and, and say, no, no, I'm not here to drink. I'm not here to eat. I'm not here to do drugs or be distracted by beautiful women. And uh, Jones is repeatedly regarded as a weirdo as a strange people say to him especially Durante you're a very strange man you have no vices you don't enjoy drinking you don't uh, enjoy partying you know uh why do you like this you know why do you not have any joy in life and and it's it's one of the things that keeps him pure as a journalist so uh I I appreciate that mythological sort of depiction of good and evil uh, uh that we see in journalism happening in the film Say, and just really quickly, and in that context, the trip to the Ukraine is the hero's descent to the underworld. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, you know, no. that, right? so <laughs> there's definitely that. That's an interesting lens. Always remember that the point would be to get information on your opponent, right? With that, with that type of party, right? That was sort of the goal of that was to how can I use my enemy's vices against him eventually. And Jones presented with no vices in this other than wanting to get the truth. So I know we don't have much time. So let's have a, uh, I do want to uh, introduce what Brittany said in the, in the discussion board. Wow, I'm really thinking about Blackboard and teaching, aren't I? Um, in our comment section. Um, but Brittany added in our conversation an interesting point here. In what way does film shape our public memory? 
You know, I wonder how the invasion of Ukraine will be told in our history books and taught in our courses. How powerful will film and storytelling be in remembering the invasion and impact on Ukraine? So I do wanna to add two comments to, to Brittany's um, points here. Two things I thought of, the same regions that are being invaded right now are the same ones that were invaded back then, right? Kharkiv is one that um, it was throughout Ukraine. However, those are the ones that were hit the most, right? And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing a very similar thing. And the second thing, and I shared this with Brian and Randy before we came together, one of the things that actually made me pretty angry watching this movie, a couple of things did, but I just thought about, I'm like, I'm watching this in 2022, 1933. It's nearly a hundred years before we actually saw a film. A hundred years. That's not good. No, it's not. And it speaks to me to the, the power and capability and success of the Soviet attempt to rewrite history in this way, to keep the truth from getting out. And that's what the film is ultimately about. I think uh, uh, cursory uh, discussions of this film might say, oh, it's a film about the Holodomor. And uh, that's not really true. Really what this is, is a, a film about, well, and it's not about the these gr ground level starvation of the Holodomor. Um, it's about the Soviet apparatuses successful attempt to keep the story of the Holodomor to, from getting out, from entering our understanding of history, from entering our conversations on these subjects. Uh, and that, that goes back to Brittany's point about film. What will, how does film, uh, and specifically Randy's point earlier, storytelling shape our understanding of what has happened? And, and the film uh, leads us to, I've probably led many uh, who are gathered here, uh, like me, to do a little research on these things. It's one of the great uh, advantages of a film like this. It opens the door to us wanting to learn more. And if you dig around a little, uh, there, there's a lot written about this uh, in the aftermath of the events of the film. Durante and Jones really uh, went to war in their respective newspapers. Um, presenting completely different stories. Durante was the one with the power and the official backing and the political purpose. And therefore his is the story that gets recorded as history and why to this day, we have a hard time um, understanding, uh, getting that story out there that nobody is aware of this. And there's a quote I wanna read from Jones's rebuttal to Durante's article that was published in the New York Times. He's talking about the difference between what he was told by consuls in Russia versus uh, what Durante has written in the paper. People are saying, you said there's a famine, but Durante says, no, there's just hunger. Um, you say there's death by starvation. And uh, Jones wrote, journalists on the other hand are allowed to write, but the censorship has turned them into masters of euphemism and understatement. Hence they give famine the polite name of food shortage and starving to death is softened down to read as widespread mortality from diseases due to malnutrition. Consuls are not so reticent in private conversations. Uh, and this quote really speaks to what the film speaks to, which is the power of words to shape our understanding of what has happened or what truth is. And this is what the Soviets did. Uh, uh, again and again, people would say, oh, is there a famine? Is there starvation? And the Soviet answer was no, there's widespread mortality from diseases due to malnutrition the experiment and collectivization has kinks to work out, you know. Um, and just throwing that that number of words at people, it just boils it all down or, or simplifies it into something that's uh, much more palatable than forced starvation. Isn't it? And isn't it the case that to this today, uh, it's you know, if you try, if you're in Russia and you call what's going on in Ukraine a war, you'll get sent to jail. You have to call it a like a you know combat operations or peacekeeping operations or whatever the euphemism Military is. exercises or whatever. Yeah, military exercises, got, something yeah. like that. Uh, you know, I mean, it goes to show you that, uh, you know, even though, uh, you know, so much has happened in uh, Russia between 1933 and 2022 or whatever it is, that there's still like a, uh, you know, this is like kind of similar thing going on in terms of like, you know, but of course it's not just a Russian phenomenon too, as I was saying before, it's like, you know, uh, Orwell in this movie is in addition to writing Animal Farm, he also wrote 1984, which introduced uh, the word newspeak to all of us. And now is like, you know, something that we deal with all the time in the United States and in totalitarian governments, um, that that control of information. And just to go back to Brittany's question about film, you know, it, one of the weird things about this movie 
is that uh, you know when uh, when we see Jones on the train going to Ukraine in the you know in his descent into the underworld or whatever, uh, the, the weird kind of artsy shots of the plane of the train and the tracks are intercut with scenes of like Soviet. Uh, Soviet filmmaking. The Soviets were great filmmakers, great propagandists for their own narrative. And in that scene of the train is some of this, just a few quick images where we see like Soviet factory workers hard at work making the future. Uh, it's as if Jones is traveling. Um, he's traveling. I'm sorry. It's, this is where he's traveling to Russia, I think, for the right, first time. Right. At the very so, beginning. Yeah, of the film. yeah. He's traveling into Russia and he's traveling into not so much just the geographical space as like the ideological space and the, the narrative space and the idea of Soviet Russia as it's been propagandized in Soviet film. Uh, and of course, you know, that, you know, that, you know, image comes crashing against the reality that he witnesses himself. But it just made me think about Brittany's question about the way that film throughout the 20th century in both the United States and in Russia was, you know, very intentionally by used by governments as a way of like trying to support their side of the story. As far as the future, it seems like to me, I feel like movies like don't really have that place, that, that place of privilege in our cultural conversation anymore. That if people are really going to like think about uh, the Ukraine war in uh, the future, it's going to be have to be a Netflix series that goes on for like five seasons and has a, a horrible last season. That's what, that's how the, so that's how the story will be told in the 21st century. I'll, I'll just sort of add, and I know we're right at time, um, but a couple of the important things you said here about the word, words matter, language matters, and, and two things, how to understand our story, but also here there's a key piece. We, um, in the Holodomor, 4 million people were passed away, right? Some estimates are upwards of 8 million. One of the research um, items that I found was there's, there has a significant, there's always been significant attacks um, on Ukrainian culture and language and government. And through the passing of 4 million, 4 million people, the Ukrainian language was not passed down, right, because of their passings. So we also have an interruption of a culture being able to recreate itself and move forward, right? So that is why today um, it is hard to find a Ukrainian speaker. It's Russian. Right, and that was also a very intentional thing. So also controlling language. We're right at time. So I, a couple things before I let everybody go. First of all, thank you both for being here to have a really rich discussion about the film. I know there's more, more to unpack in this film. We could probably talk for another two or three hours um, about this particular narrative. So I want to thank Ryan and Randy for being here today. Thank you to all our, our, our audience who is here. Um, I will still stay back if you want to chat about something because we didn't provide a great uh, time for question and answer. So if there's anybody who wants to chat, I'm happy to wait for a little bit um, and continue that conversation. And lastly, our third uh, lecture of this series is going to be next Thursday at 1230, same time, same place. Um, we're taking our conversation about information, the next step forward, but we're taking it into digital technology. So next week, we're going to talk about the crucial need for cybersecurity. So we're going to talk about some of the issues that we're seeing today in cybersecurity and how is that controlling information just like we had in this conversation today. So if you can join us, I'd be happy to see you. Thank you again for coming today. And if you have any questions, I'll still stay back for a few minutes, okay? Thank you again.